So our next speaker is Professor Richard Keane. We heard him yesterday as well, and he's a consultant in metabolic bone disease at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in London. And he's going to give a talk about pharmacological pain management. So, welcome. Lovely. Well, thank you very much indeed. I, I appreciate it. I'm between you and lunch, so I will make sure I do keep to time. Um, I think, again, I think, again, I just want to make a comment from, the, from Cathy's talk. I think, what, to me, that highlights both the importance of having, you know, an osteo a service for patients with osteogenesis in fact, to, 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 to be sort of being checked in at at intervals, and, as in pre, that pre-surgical assessment. But I think also from a you know, from a surgical perspective as well, for the elective surgery, I think, again, trying to make sure you, you're going to a site where the surgeon has experience um, and you've got that multidisciplinary team. I think it's really key. Obviously, in the, in the acute setting, you've probably got to manage wherever that might happen. But, you know, but it, I think, again, it just highlights the real importance of these sort of se centres of expertise, really, that where, where, where people can get access to appropriate care and, 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 and treatment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pharmacological management. Again, in a way, I'm going to be talking about the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I suppose, in some ways. Because I think what we've heard through the last couple of days is the fact that you know, a lot of patients are on sort of uh, pain-killing treatments, but actually they probably don't work that well. And actually, probably what actually what's going to be more important, I think, is what we hear after lunch about some of the other strategies that are going to be perhaps both safer and we hope more effective, and we need to work through with that. And again, I think even Cathy alluded to sort of the other approaches that you're using, sort of you know post fracture and the mindfulness and things like that. So again, I'm really going to be just going through some of the treatments, and most of you have probably tried some of these. I'm just going to be highlighting again some of the good, and particularly though some of the bad, and therefore maybe these aren't the, these aren't the solutions. So um, I'm hoping again at the end of the sort of 10, 15 minutes or so, depending on the chair, so how long I'm allowed to uh, talk for, um, you know, that basically I'm going to hope you just got a little idea about sort of the, the, the types of pain experience. We all know that pretty much. We're going to talk through the different painkillers. Again, Kathy's alluded to those. And understanding the risks and benefits, because again, that's something that you need to be available thinking about, particularly for over-the-counter medicines that you might just be going and buying yourself. And then also for us as the doctors, what are we giving you? What are, the, are they actually working? And you know, sort of, you know, and again, where will they fit in in the OI patient group? I've seen, I've, I've showed this yesterday. Again, we've heard a bit about the sort of the acute pain, how you would manage that. Again. What I'm left with is, as a rheumatologist is sort of trying to treat your sort of the, the more chronic pain. You know, the, the acute pain, you know, that's going to be left. We'll leave that to the surgeons with the fractures. But we're, we're trying to treat sort of the more chronic pain symptoms. And again, we're, we're going to discuss sort of how the, the various treatments fit in, fit in these pathways. So what most of us in the, you know, most people who work through either, this is what you might be doing yourself without realizing it. Most of us over many years have been sort of working on this, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization pain ladder. And this was designed primarily for um, how you would manage patients with cancer, um, with the pain associated with cancer. And it basically goes through a sort of a, a sort of hierarchical system. So essentially, you're starting off with very sort of simple medicines that, again, you could you could buy buying yourself. Essentially, sort of NSAIDs um, and sort of and and um, and, and things like paracetamol. And then gradually, as you go up that ladder, the intensity of those treatments sort of increases, and they become sort of you know, uh, and you're moving sort of up to sort of strong opioids at the end. And again, sort of, and we heard at the very start of the talk how it'd be very easy for someone to fix your pain instantaneously, almost with, with, with a slug of intravenous morphine. And that's, that's great if you've got a really, you know, if you're having a heart attack or you've got a really bad fracture, but that's not, gonna, that's not for everyday living. You know, you're not going to be able to live in that sort of context. So it's basically just being aware that, that you know, most of us, as you go through this, this scale, um, is, is how we do it. And of course, you know, you'll be there with your symptoms uh, and sort of we will be titrating the drugs accordingly um, to, to how, how you're feeling. So this again is, is the sort of the batting list of the of, of, of the drugs that are, that are sort of available. So again, you've got those sort of non non opioid drugs. Sorry, at, at the at the top, then you've got a, a variety of opioid uh, drugs that, that that can be used with different sort of potencies, and then we've got this adjuvant sort of number of drugs again, sort of which are perhaps can be added in together. 
um, or what you might find is, is, is that some of them you know, are perhaps going to be more focused on the sort of neuropathic pain symptoms where they get that burning pain, etc. Um, and again, in some patients, you end up being on a mixture. And again, I think we heard from some of the surveys that a lot of patients, you know, could end up being on two, three, four, five different classes of drugs. And again, sort of, you know, that's great. But again, as an adult, particularly if you're on those opioid ones, you've got a function, you've got a life to live, you know, and, you, or even as a child, you've got schooling to do, etc. So it's trying to make that balance because a lot of these drugs will, as we sort of discussed, you know, will sort of slight to cause some sort of degree of sedation, in, or they can do, they might impair your ability to drive, they might impair your ability to drink, uh, you know, and for those of you from last night, so, you know, just being aware of that, so, you know, I, I, th I think just, just being careful about some of these, you know, wh how, you, how these drugs interact with your everyday life is really, really important. So, turning to, again, the, the sort of the, the classic sort of, um, s sort of pathway of pain mechanism, you know, obviously, if you injure yourself, if you have that fracture, you, you stimulate sort of nerve endings in, in damaged tissue. Basically, they send signals into your spinal cord that then goes up to your brain. And again, the different drugs work in different parts of that pathway. Some of them work at the sort of almost the site of injury. Um, and again, ice will be basically trying to reduce some of those um, chemical release of tissue damage, etc., in, in, sort of, in the sort of part of the body you've injured. So you can try and stimulate or reduce things there. And then obviously some of the other drugs will work more in the, in the sort of central nervous system and have an impact on there. So again, how the drugs will work um, did, is, is sort of sh shown on, on that table there. And again, obviously the drugs that work more on the central nervous system are the ones that are going to perhaps do strange things to your mind at times. So just being aware of that. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these would be things um, like ibuprofen, naproxen, uh, Voltarol, um, Atoracoxib, um, Celebrex, Celecoxib. And so again, there are sort of th th these drugs work by inhibiting basically an enzyme called cyclooxygenase. And again, this enzyme is, is, is basically can be um, sort of produced at, at sites of inflammation or damage. And so therefore, when you sort of, if you twist your ankle, you can pop an ibuprofen and it'll start reducing the sort of the, the, the effects of inflammation at that site. So that's great. So, you know, they're really useful when you, you know, if, 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 if you have some tissue damage. The problem is, is that there's also, the, the, this enzyme is sort of there all the time in the background. And so again, what that, and again, Kathy alluded to there, the fact that, you know, the, 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 the drugs can also then affect things like your stomach. You can get stomach ulcers. They can affect your kidneys. So again, so there's, there's basically, the, so that's where the concept of the other drugs like atoracoxib, and Celebrex came in because these, these um, drugs of the anti-inflammatories sort of target basically the, the, uh, the cyclooxygenase that's produced at the time of inflammation, not the one that's there sort of in the background doing the day-to-day -day sort of maintenance sort of effects. So again, so anti-inflammatories do have side effects. And again, because of things like GI toxicity, you know, and so again, with the fact of perhaps irritating your stomach, some people might then take a, a, a proton pump inhibitor, something like a meprazole, um, which again can reduce acid secretion in the stomach. And again, there's some data in the osteoporosis world that those sorts of drugs might also have an impact on increasing your fracture rate. So again, you then are taking a drug to help your pain, but it's increasing your risk of fracture. And that's probably not a great idea for people with OI. So again, it's trying to sort of get that sort of concept. So, you know, we need to be a little bit cautious about that. And again, Cathy again alluded to the fact that, that non-steroidals can impair fracture healing. And again, this is some data um, looked at from the UK, where they're again showing that actually, you know, the use of non-steroidals was associated with an increased risk of basically non-union and sort of a delayed union in patients who, who suffered fractures. So, and had sort of surgery. So again, just being aware that if you're on long-term um, non-steroidal treatment for, for pain relief, that again, if you then did a fracture, maybe your recovery will be a bit slower, and then that might affect your, your sort of subsequent rehabilitation. So moving on to opioids. Opioids have uh, a very potent uh, treatments. They also have a number of side effects. And again, we've, I've listed them there, and we had a talk yesterday about the GI complications of, um, of, 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 of the condition of the, a scene in, patient, in people with osteogenesis imperfecta. Those um, characters there are sort of TV people in the UK, quite known as that Anton Deck, um, and they're sort of our sort of maybe sort of they they're not quite the ABBA of, of, of the UK, um, but essentially the the gentleman on, on your left, he basically had a basic orthopedic surgery, 
and basically then became quite addicted to opioid um, uh, analgesic medicines. And again, just showing that these drugs can have quite a lot of impact on, on sort of af affecting your ability to function. And he actually then was taken off air for a little bit, but they're now back. Um, but essentially, um, you know, that it, that they, these drugs, although they're very effective, again, long term, and we do know, again, there's an awful lot of concern in you know, parts of the world about opioid addiction and how it can affect people. So just being aware of that. Opioids, again, they're great for short-term sort of relief of symptoms. But again, there's data, again, this is going into the osteoporosis world, but again, you know, the opioids do appear to be associated with increased risk of fracture, okay? So this, again, these are various studies, a bit complicated, I apologise for this, but essentially the fact that this sort of triangle, I'm going to be careful and trip over here, sort of around here, is sort of more sort of on the right-hand side would say that, those, that these drugs are associated in, these, in the, the summary of all these clinical trials into basically sort of an increased risk of having a fracture. And again, this is just some data from another sort of study from the UK looking at patients, uh, looking at about 17 million patients. This is from GP records. So they were able to collect information and showing that compared to, well, so you can see tramadol had an increased risk of hip fracture compared to patients that were taking codeine. And on the right, you've got num another type of um, sort of various non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And again, showing that if you're on sort of longer term tramadol, that again, there was an increased risk of, of other fractures. And this is probably due to the fact that, it, you know, that these opioid drugs make you a bit more dizzy and you're more likely to fall over and therefore, uh, you know, therefore you're suffering this sort of fracture. So again, I think it's just really important to, to sort of just, just be aware that these drugs long term have, have, have some, some sort of side effects. So again, in our um, country in the UK, we, sort of, we have sort of recommendations and guidelines. Um, these are basically some guidelines published through, through our National Institute of Clinical Excellence, looking at the type of drugs we should use for patients with chronic pain. And again, on the left, you've got the drugs that are given the, yep, go for it. And on the, on, the, on, the, on, on the right, you've got the no's. You've basically got the no drugs that they would say. Now, again, that's the recommendations, but we know that you know, one of the things we often have to do is to sort of mix and match a little bit. So there will be patients. It's not saying if you're, you know, if you're on those drugs on the right-hand side, don't stop them. You know, but again, this is what people are saying generally for chronic sort of treatments. You probably, you know, you'd want to try not to treat those, but actually, um, you know, we know in some patients that's what you have to do. Turning again to topical for the um, for pa patients with uh, oste uh, with osteogenesis imperfection and bone disease, we have the bisphosphonates. Um, obviously, this is the an alphabetical list of drugs that are that are used in uh, in, in the UK and Europe. Just again, for those of you that are on the, on the right, so bisphosphonates started off 50 odd years ago as sort of almost as water softeners. So that's why I've put CALG on there for you. Um, and then eventually the chemists eventually tweaked them a little bit to make them sort of obviously work selectively in bone. Uh, and then we have this, the, the, these, these drugs that are available. Obviously in the OI community, we, we're more used to using zoledronate, pomidronate, say in the children, and then we've got the oral bisphosphonates as well. Do bisphosphonates work in adults with OI? I mean, I often spend a lot of my time, you know, we, we have patients transitioning across, um, you know, they've been on regular intravenous bisphosphonates or maybe oral. What's the evidence for them in adults? It's, it's not great, is one thing. Um, this is just some data, again, sort of uh, meta-analyses that have been looking, or some studies looking at the number of patients that have been studied in adults' world, um, and showing that actually there's not a great evidence that they actually work that well. So. Again, there's a lot more work needed as what is the optimal treatment for someone's bones um, with, as an adult with osteogenesis imperfecta. Just looking at, uh, again, this is the field of osteoporosis, but this is a study, again, it's a very small study, showing that pomidronate worked for sort of reducing pain uh, post-vertebral fracture. So again, I think a lot of us would still use, think of using an intravenous bisphosphonate acutely um, for, for an individual having a, having a spine fracture. But again, the evidence is not great. And again, you know, this was a study of just 32 um, uh, sort of adult uh, patients. There's some data um, or some recommendations in the UK, again, looking at osteoporosis. But again, I still think it's quite, it could be relevant for people with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta um, if you have a vertebral fracture. And again, it sort of gives the sort of the, um, the, sort of the, the treatment regimes that they would probably try and use. 
But at the same time, you know, we would be trying to encourage still some mobility, uh, you know, physiotherapy, stuff like that as well, because again, the last thing you want to do is to really stiffen up. But again, just highlights again, simple analgesics, uh, and then more st slightly stronger painkillers, but again, trying to mobilize and improve you. And again, a lot of the adult doctors looking after adult patients will be perhaps osteoporosis specialists, so they should be aware of these sorts of guidelines. Very quickly, um, just moving on, again, Cannabis products, at least in the UK, we're not allowed to prescribe them, okay? So, um, for, 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 for chronic pain relief. Um, and again, this is our recommendations from our, uh, nice, from our NICE um, committees. If people want to go and get their own supplies, illicitly or whatever, that's up to them. Um, but essentially, we're not, we're, we're, we're not recommended uh, to use them. So, in summary, I mean, I think that, you know, we know this is the data again from the, uh, br the sort of brittle bone consortium. Um, essentially, we do know that you, you know a lot of individuals with um, osteogenes imperfecta uh, have pain, you know, have chronic pain, have acute pain, um, and we do know that you know the, the biggest drugs that are used are non nonsteroidals and bisphosphonates. But actually, again, the evidence for that is not great, um, and I think we need to do better. Um, because either because of side effects or because of lack of evidence. Uh, and again, I'm hoping that in the, in the afternoon we'll, we'll be learning more about sort of other techniques and strategies which perhaps are going to be safer, uh, particularly for a long-term condition. Yeah, use these drugs when, when you've got acute pain, short-term pain, but long-term we, we need a much better strategy to go forward. And so again, I thank my team. And again, straight after lunch, you're going to hear from Sophie, who will hopefully give you a bit more insight into other, these other <laughs> strategies. And with that, I'm happy to take questions, or we can all go for an early lunch. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Then we are, have time for some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you for your great talk. Um, do you feel more comfortable as a rheumatologist to, be, because of the slide that you showed that uh, the yes and no's of uh, chronic pain, as a rheumatologist, do you feel more comfortable putting antidepressant drugs than to paracetamol or NSAIDs for chronic pain, even if, it, if it's chronic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I suppose as a rheumatologist, we are used to managing, you know, arthritic pain, you know, from particularly both, well, I, I don't do a lot of inflammatory arthritis, but I do sort of wear and tear. So I think we're, we're happy, you know, up to a point. So I will be happy to prescribe yeah, simple analgesics. I would still, I'm happy to prescribe anti, uh, antidepressants, those sorts of other treatments as well. I think if it becomes a bit more complicated, then I would refer to a, my pain management specialists that, that we have access to if I, had, if I, if I needed to. But for this more basic um, tr assessments, I, I, I'm quite happy. <laughs> And at the same time, we would use our family physicians as well. The family GPs are also reasonably happy to sort of help prescribe some of that as well. England. Yes, um, thank you for a great talk. Um, I have a question about the antidepressants, yep. drugs, uh, amitriptyline and uh, mm -hmm. similar. Yep. Uh, are there no side effects? Or why are they so much better than the other stuff? Well, they're not really better. I think they're just working in a slightly different way. I mean, they, have a, they still have their same side effect profile. Um, and, you know, and in some individuals, you know, we, for instance, we know that with amitriptyline, you can start quite low, you can increase the dose. But often a lot of patients can wake up with a sort of a bit of a hangover the next day that you can get this knockover effect. And again, that's not great for people. And sometimes we have to adjust the dose depending on someone's body size, etc. So there's it's something that it's it it's not that they're not side they're not side effect free at all, um, but it's just, it's just it's just managing sort of it's just trying to find out which works for individual. And again, I think it's almost going to that individualized medicine, personalized medicine. It's almost like you. I think again, we can't just treat the whole the people in this whole room. If everyone today had a headache from too much drink last night, different people will respond to different painkillers, and it's just trying to work out what works for that individual. There's a question on it, yeah. Dagmar. Hello. Hi. Um, I would like to thank you also for this fabulous uh, talk. You are one of the, well, top uh, five people in the world that can really knowledgeably talk about these topics. So thank you so much. And um, I would just like to know, um, how can we move towards um, bigger um, studies, for example, that you showed 
how small the numbers are. Yeah. And adult healthcare really is on a catch-up mode. Let's be honest, it's 90% um, of all the research I think is on, on pediatric yeah. care and we, we all want that. You know that there's groups in the US and a couple of others in your bone that are working on adult healthcare. So the question is, how can we move the needle for adult healthcare together with all the people who know something, like, like yourselves? Um, I mean, again, that's probably a whole conference in itself, isn't it? I mean, it's, I mean, so I, I think, again, I, th I mean, therapeutically, I mean, I think, you know, there, ha there are initiatives, as in, for instance, there's the, um, the Topaz clinical trial is, is a study looking at sort of 350 adults comparing teriparatide followed by zolindronic acid against standard care. The problem is the standard care is going to be a mishmash of everything because different people do different things. I know that, you know, the within, I mean, unfortunately, again, being part of the UK, we're no, we're no longer part of ERN bond. Um, but, you know, I know that they've been looking at guidelines. The UK are going to try and come up with some, I think we need some try and some consistency, if we can, of how we think we want to manage. Or we, we tr I mean, again, perhaps on the back of some of the other treatments, you know, that are coming forward with, um, you know, that we might be able to get some capturing, not with, a, they were talking not of having new registries, but just sort of capturing data. And then, yeah, just, working collaboratively somehow in some sort of forums. But again, that's probably going to be something that we need to tag on to other meetings, to, I don't know, to you know, I OIF meetings, to ASBMRs. I don't know, just, we just need to work together. And meetings like this are at least a start. The last question goes to Rebecca before we meet for the group photo. So I definitely uh, recommend still working together even yeah. after Brexit. Oh, thank you. But my, my <laughs> question is, um, I'm surprised you didn't mention, I mean, a lot of people with OI have a smaller body uh, portion yeah, yeah. and a short stature. Mm -hmm. And this also is an issue when you discuss pain medication with yeah. a doctor because yeah. you don't fit into the exactly. recommendations. Yeah. So how, do you, uh, how, do, how would you address that and what would you recommend us patients to tell the doctors if they say, well, you weigh this and that? So you're not having more than this and that, and you still have pain. So again, I, I think I think you're right. So I think you know you have to, yeah, because either that you'll either end up being treated sort of with a pediatric dose, which is but equally, although you might be a slightly smaller stature, you know your liver and your kidneys are probably working at a, an adult rate. So therefore, I think you should be encouraging people to push things up a little bit. I think, and I think it highlights to me the the importance of you know, being able to tap into people that understand your condition. Because what you want, I mean, so if I'm, if I'm seeing a, 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 someone who's got the condition I'm looking after, and but maybe a, a, their family doctor is going to be the one that's actually prescribing the medicine in, in our healthcare system. But if I'm giving that, if I'm giving that direction and saying this, this individual needs to have the adult dose, or we want to push it, or I want to add in this other treatment, then that gives the confidence to, to their family doctor that that's the right thing to do. So I think, I think it just highlights that, again, the worry for me is, is that a lot of individuals, you know, you're being looked after by people that don't understand your condition. And that's the challenge, isn't it? And it's trying to sort of get you to, to see that person. And that, again, where I think though telemedicine might be ways that you could be speaking to someone who's the expert who then gives that information to your local doctor um, to give them the confidence that, that they're doing, they're doing an okay thing. So yeah, I think it's individualized medicine, but with people that understand OI in this case. Good words. Oui. Thank you very right. much, Thank Richard. You. And you. see you all outside.